Miles Neal, what's happening, man? What up? What up? What up? We're in Thank New York City. Thank you so much, and pleasure to meet you, and happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, our introducer, Saadi Simone, uh, funny, he came over last night to have a birthday dinner with me here at the hotel. We had a fantastic conversation for about three hours. I mean, he and I just have this incredible dialogue sort of chemistry and uh he's very capable of that yeah yeah he is I, and i am too and afterward I, I had this thought i was like man i should have recorded that and made a podcast <laughs> episode the conversation was a little too personal i think uh for that but we had a great conversation and in the conversation i said oh i'm really excited tomorrow i'm interviewing this guy miles neal and he's like Dude, I introduced you. <laughs> and it's funny because in the interview, I was going to ask you, who introduced us anyway? Yeah. You know, I just, I got this slew of emails and put out a slew of emails prior to coming out here to the city yeah. and just, you know, tried to set up as much as I could. And uh, it was right around that time that Saw reached out and said, dude, you definitely want to catch this guy when you're here. So, yeah, Saw is amazing, isn't he? He's yeah. got so much energy. I don't know exactly what he's got in his smoothies, but he's really rocking. Yeah, he is. He's really rocking. Yeah, he's a great guy. So, Saw, if you ever hear this, uh, thank you for the great conversation. And birthday dinner last night and thank you for the introduction so i want to jump right into it in the interest of time uh you are a wealth of experience and information i've listened to some of your podcast i've perused speed reading version of your book gradual awakening that we have here on the table and it's one of those times where i'm like i really probably need three hours here with you and i'll do a mega show so maybe we'll end up doing a part two but i want to you know I, I want a little bit of history just for context uh and then I want to just go right into the deep end. Let's do it. So we don't have time. You grew up in a wealthy family that was had two successful parents, but there was not a lot of connection and love. I'm totally taking this from what I've learned about you, uh, and were essentially quite unhappy in your youth and adolescence, which eventually led to you taking a pilgrimage to India at around 20. Do I have that right? You do have that right, and I'm so thankful that you got that right. And uh, I'm surprised too with all the. Uh research that you do that you have that keen awareness but yes that's all true I even bear the scars of an unhappy childhood when I was about 16 or 17 I was cutting and burning and uh, really taking out my rage physically and internally and really um, probably I mean I was classically depressed as a very young kid so very very unhappy and that's this that's really I think for and you can you can you can confirm this in your own experience as a coach uh, and dealing with so many people, uh, just the doorway into the spiritual world is usually a tremendous amount, a deluge of unhappiness, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to make light of your trauma. I'm sure you've detached from it enough, but I would say you're kind of a cutting edge pioneer when it comes to the cutting and things like that. You're <laughs> you're a little bit older. I thought that was a relatively new phenomenon. Oh, no. When I was a kid, you just smoked weed and like snuck Playboys out of your uncle's trailer. Well, or I'm not saying that wasn't happening either. But right. <laughs> but I think uh, maybe drinking and smoking and hanging out, these were all, you know, they, I tried those and was so unsuccessful to turn the ship around, really. And so it just got, I sort of landslided into more destructive behavior as I went by. And, uh, and you know, this, the, the story of the Buddha, not to equate myself with the story of the Buddha, but the Buddha is someone in, in, as an archetype, let's say, who has tremendous wealth and fortune and is also has what we would call in the matrix a thorn in the mind, some level of yearning that is not being fed by just about everything that we have around in our reality. And and so in a way, my I don't think my story is all that unique. I mean, I think, I mean, I may, it may be, I may be kind of biased because it's my story, but I've also had thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of contact experience with clients and students and people in the Western culture and the m modern setting in the secular world we are positioned to have a great amount of wealth and fortune and opportunity, and yet I, I don't think it's a unique thing that people are very hungry, they're disenchanted, they are disillusioned, they are not feeling fed, they are not feeling fulfilled, uh, and, and so we have an epidemic of depression, uh, and uh, so I don't, in a way, don't think my, my situation is all that unique from a starting point. I would say probably... I started the spiritual journey fairly early. It's not 
unheard of, but I, I mean, relative to, I mean, you get people in their 40s and 50s having midlife crisis finally saying, well, okay, well, the Lear jets and the trips around the world and my, my growing bank account hasn't, has failed me. And, and, you know, what are the alternatives? But I was looking for those alternatives at 16 and 17. And by the time I was 20, I, I was in India. And, you know, before you and I met, we were talking about your experience, probably something very similar drove you to India. You know, what was that? Yeah, for me, it was wanting to have a firsthand experience of Shakti with a guru. <laughs> and I thought, and did you get it? In a sense, oh, in, a, in, a, in a slowly <laughs> unfolding way. But uh, yeah, I went to, um, well, I went to see Sai Baba, who had been, well, some of my family had no been way. devotees Sai of Sai Baba. Baba. And so I went to his ashram in Puttaparthi, and I traveled all through Southern India. And then I spent three weeks in a silent retreat at a place called Golden City, uh, which was well, part of that uh, journey was that you learned how to do diksha, which is this sort of like energy healing kind of thing. Um, and I naively thought that I would probably become enlightened for the $5,000 that I paid to be there. And then I would be able to come back, <laughs> <laughs> that I'd be able to come back and bestow enlightenment <laughs> upon others. I mean, I had very grandiose uh, high hopes. Uh, but how I think. old are you? Um, this is like four months ago. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I was, um, I would have been in my early thirties. Yeah. Two, yeah. Probably 33, 34, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 48 as of yesterday, but yeah, it was just, I mean, I couldn't find it, the it that I was looking for in Los Angeles, you know, and I had read all these miraculous stories and heard the stories of Ram Dass and all of these people that had gone to India. And as a result had some sort of experience that forever changed their uh, experience of life and so I was looking for that experience and um, and got it in a sense you know yeah. because I came back and realized oh there was a lot of ego motive there and wanting to go become spiritual quotes end quotes mm. and um, and to become special in some way and I even came back and was doing the namaste hands at my friends and they'll get the fuck out of here with that you know like my friends were not having see it right through it yeah yeah and I was like what I, I I'm, I'm being spiritual it's like no dude be real. And so it was just, you know, it's an amazing part of the journey, but it did have a huge impact. So when you went to India at 20, um, like, where did you first go? What was the point at which you landed? Were, were you there to go to some sort of ashram or monastery or? Yeah, I, I mean, the journey starts a few years earlier as a freshman at, at the at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. And I had first year freshman, first seminar, had experienced a, uh, a Buddhist psychologist. He was combining Zen and psychotherapy. He was a Harvard-trained psychoanalyst, but had spent many years at a Zen monastery in Korea. And he was he was doing kind of integrative seminars, uh, designing curriculum, because at that time, people on that level, they were kind of pioneers, first generation people doing a fusion. This is like uh, the, the cu you know, the cutting edge of fusion between uh, East and West. And uh, I was very inspired by his work. I found in him someone who was really thinking outside the box and really speaking to me very early on. And I kind of gelled with him. And he took me under his wing, and I needed that. I needed a kind of proto-father figure, if you will, someone who was kind and available, but also really was going to provide that direction, which I really needed. And he said, listen, if you're really interested in this, I mean, he took me to, the, to meditate at the Zen Center. Uh, he was taking me into the library and off hours and giving me tips on great books and, and, and giving me, inviting me back to his house and his garden and his Zen garden and his house in Duxbury uh, was in Providence, Rhode Island. It was unbelievable. And we we're getting into all this uh, sort of very deep conversation. There wasn't, as I'm sure you and I will gel today in this conversation, there's not much time for superficialities about, you know, time is running out. And, and I wanted to go deep really quickly, and he took me there. And in our conversations over the few weeks, he then decided, listen, you, you can go the traditional college route and pursue your courses, or you can work privately with me and I'll find a way around the, the, the program here and we'll design your own. We'll make your own college degree. And we'll combine Buddhism and psychotherapy together, and you'll work with me, and you'll bypass all the traditional formula, and uh, I will supervise you, and we'll do it. And you can, it's called a Wheaton Scholar Program, and you can create your own, basically. And I, I said, that's fantastic. So I work with him, and we, we set about combining a six-month stint in India through a college abroad program. So it was already a previously established program called the Antioch Buddhist Studies Program, very famous. 
It was based out of the Burmese temple in Bodh Gaya. The Bodh Gaya, for those that don't know it, is where the Buddha gained enlightenment in India. And the Burmese Vihar is a temple that saw some of the luminary figures of Western Buddhism in their early 20s and 30s were based there. People like Ram Das, people like Sharon Salzberg, Joseph Goldstein, uh, Jack Cornfield, Christopher Titmus, you name it, the first generation of people that are interested in Buddhist meditation and vipassana and mindfulness had spent their early years at the Burmese Vihar. And <clears throat> this college abroad program allowed you to take courses in anthropology, in f Buddhist philosophy, in Buddhist meditation, and in uh, history and language. A complete immersion, living in a temple with the, with the monks, waking up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning to do meditation, a stone's throw away from the Tree of Enlightenment where the Buddha gained uh, his liberation. And Bodh Gaya is a particularly unique setting where all the cultural ambassadors of Buddhism from around the various countries that are Buddhist around the world have their representative monastery there in their traditional style. So you could walk across the street from the Burmese temple and find a Thai temple right next to a Japanese temple, right next to a Chinese temple, right next to a Tibetan temple. And this was the anthropology lesson of the day, is to go to a various monastery and see how they venerate the Buddha and how they meditate and their worldview and their philosophy and their ethic. Uh, in a immersive quality to it. And it was so profound and so amazing, but probably the most amazing thing that happened to me while I was there was, of course, meeting a teacher. I mean, that is always the, uh, you know, that's what you go for in India, right? I wasn't expecting to meet a teacher, but I was caught off guard and fell in love with a teacher who was very direct and very simple and very loving. And like all the burning and slashing and cutting that was a consequence of not feeling loved and not feeling worthy and not feeling that there was enough time and space to connect. That was transformed in this moment with this teacher. Wow. Wow. And I remember one evening I had, of course, with all the childhood traumas, I had a, a history of sleep disturbance. I would never really let myself fall asleep. It was almost like a post-traumatic hypervigilance. And I went to his room one day and I said, I'm really having trouble sleeping. And he said, well, come on in and we'll talk and we'll hang out. And, you know, he had, there were three beds in the room because <clears throat> uh, uh, it was a, like a monastic style. <clears throat> and we talked into the evening and then he said, you know, why don't you lay down on your side in the classic uh, iconic pose of the Buddha during his, what's called the Parinirvana, the the, the moments before his death, which he's lying on his side. And like in Bangkok, for example, there's a gilded Buddha that's lying on his side, this classic pose. And he said, sleep that way, and I'll be right here in this other bed with you. And if you need anything, let me know. And I slept wonderfully that night. And at like 4.30, we both got up together, unannounced, without alarms, without bells, without whistles, without, you know, sort of any, no performance element to it naturally. And I remember it clearly it was still dark and we walked hand in hand down a dusty path from the Burmese Vihar to the tree of enlightenment and sat underneath the Bodhi tree together and just in silence did breathing meditation right there. And the early morning chants filled the Mahabodhi stupa and the sun rose, and I thought to myself, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. It wasn't a profound discourse. It was just presence. It was just someone really, really intuitively available and connecting and, and caring without saying, I care for you. It was like beyond words. And it made a huge, huge impact on me. And it was, like, it was like love. It was like coming home. So I found a place. I found a practice. I found a philosophy. But I found an embodiment, right? And without the embodiment, it's just concepts. Nice, nice concepts. And I think that that is a kind of, at 20 years old, that is a massive redirection or reorientation of my life. And, you know, everything from there comes. Yeah, there's something in your work that I appreciate uh, as you, and I want to get into this concept of um, Mick mindfulness, which I find hilarious uh, in many ways and almost disturbing, but uh, we'll get into that. <laughs> but uh, just, you know, because having 
been someone who's really put myself through the fire and, you know, put my feet to the fire, rather, I should say, and just ugh, like really grow at all costs, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Um, uh, this idea of spiritual bypass and all that, I want to get into that a little bit. I think one of the traps that I've observed with some people, and, and more so I would say younger people, which you would have been the exception to this, of course, uh, based on what you just said, but is the lack of A, a teaching and a teacher, and just thinking that we can kind of meditate or mindfulness our way into, uh, you know, real transformation. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, the same thing. I had to have a framework, a teaching, which has changed. I've never, like, adhered to one specific teaching per se, but just understanding that there are spiritual laws and principles existent that are available to us. And if we learn what they are and have a teacher demonstrate or model for us how to apply them in one's life, then we can kind of monkey see monkey do our way into applying them and integrate them into my own life and therefore having a transformation. Uh, can you explain from your perspective, the importance of, of finding that, you know, you had your first mentor, which led you to India, and then you found an actual teacher. How does, you know, the teacher and having a path or a teaching and contemplative study and reading and all of this play into it versus just like, cool, I'll learn to meditate and do yoga and everything's going to be rosy. I mean, I think in the tradition, they would say that there are people who are self-taught. They won't deny that. In the same way I write in the book that, I mean, you're from LA, so you know about classic trained French culinary chefs, right? And then once in a while, there's somebody who's self-taught that can really just knock people out right? They don't have the classic training. They didn't go to Switzerland and they didn't train in a hotel management training program. They didn't go to the Culinary Institute. Um, but they just, they have something, they have some deep passion, some deep yearning, and they have some finesse and some beauty and some aesthetic and some drive. And they're really, really courageous and bold and they teach themselves and what they put out blows people away. But you'd have to say that those kind of people are the exception. You, you could have to say both two things, that it's possible to be self-taught and have an exceptional experience, but it's the rarity. And, and then so for everybody else, you know, following a curriculum, following a path, following a core set of principles and having a guide, having somebody show you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and then, but really more than just a teacher, the actual mentor figure, someone who has achieved a level of embodiment is the greatest teaching, as you say, monkey do. I mean, there's like everything that we learn in life, with the exception of these few protégés, you could say, or exceptional people, we learn far quicker and far better when someone teaches it, and that person has already accomplished something. So even if it's mundane things like being a pianist, you go find the best bloody concert pianist you can find to train you. Go to Juilliard and you find someone who in four years you know, can take you along certain developmental milestones and lead you to a place where you can actualize what the master has to teach you. And it's uh, funny, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into it now, but <clears throat> in Tibet, around the first few hundred years of the transmission from Buddhism in India to Tibet, there comes a point where they are bringing a whole slew of teachings across the Himalayas into this the new sort of new domain or new region. And there's a king that's patronizing all these uh incoming, you know, uh, f you know, disbursements of, of knowledge. And he comes upon a uh, two kind of two streams, let's say. One stream is a stream of teachings that say that enlightenment can be sudden. It can be had spontaneously. And there is another stream that suggests, well, yes, you could have a spontaneous enlightenment, but for the masses, really, you have to follow a curricula and you have to follow a gradual progression. And they go for 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 years. And literally, in the in the in the text, it says that this dialogue and this debate between these two traditions happens for years. I mean, can you imagine having debates on one topic for years? And eventually, it's determined that for the the main populace it would be far more productive and effective 
if they institutionalized a curriculum that allowed people to steadily unfold in their process of development towards enlightenment. And that at no time did they dismiss the importance and, and value and possibility of a spontaneous poof moment of enlightenment. But what they're basically saying is for the average person, if you go the spontaneous route, you're going to be sort of tw twiddling your thumbs waiting for lightning to strike you. And even in the modern context, you have people that say they have had a spontaneous enlightenment. I mean, people like Eckhart Tolle, for example, is one of them. And Byron Katie, too. Byron Katie, yeah. and you in the last generation, you would have had someone like Krishnamurti. And you, you cannot argue that something profound has shifted in them. You can see that. It is it's exceedingly rare, though. It is rare, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, if, I mean, if you, you and I were... you can name the top three or four that kind of come to mind that are recent, you know, within our generation. It's like, mm, okay, I'm out. Yes. You know, it's like the list is short. Yeah. That, the that we're aware it of. It can I mean, be there, discouraging, there right? There could be a cabbie or, you know, uh, the local custodian. You or, never uh, know. You never you know. know. That, that's enlightened suddenly like that, but we don't know because they don't write books and they're not on Sounds True and whatever, you know. Exactly. But for us... It can be a little discouraging because you can be practicing very earnestly and no sort of mind-blowing experience happens. Although, you know, I'd love to talk to you about this. I think the movement these days towards the use of psychedelics, psychotropics, ayahuasca, etc., to me, these fit into the rubric of a spontaneous enlightenment. Because I think what's happening when you take those very powerful substances in a ceremonial context, I think you are having a radical breakthrough of mind. However, as a therapist... Since the last eight years, I'd say six years, maybe even the last four years, who's coming knocking on the door in my therapy business is people who've had very profound breakthroughs having had an ayahuasca experience on, you know, one of these ayahuasca vacations. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> and now, boom, they've had something spontaneous happen, but, but what, 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 what's next? What... How do I integrate what I've seen? A lot and, of those uh, vacations seem to happen in Brooklyn. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I meet people all the time like, oh, I went on a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Was it rough in the jungle of Peru? And they're like, no, I was in Williamsburg. I was upstate New yeah. York. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. So anyway, carry, carry on. Yeah. So it, spontane, I would say spontaneous enlightenment is possible and maybe even more possible now for more people because of the availability and the trend towards the use of psychedelic substances that mimic or give access to very profound deep states of consciousness that are non-dual that are that open portals into levels of awareness where we can lose the self and re and see how reality is much more flexible or fluid or interconnected and and, and experiences of profound love and and selflessness which all the major yogic traditions are talking about, but now here you don't have to spend 20 years in a monastery or in a cave trying to earnestly meditate your way there. You can very quickly, radically, and, and with, with high predictability have these altered states of consciousness. But just as they said in Tibet in those early years, even if you have a profound breakthrough, you're still going to have to have a gradual integration of what you see and what you experience. So whether you take the gradual path to have a profound awakening or you go directly to the tip of the mountain by way of psychedelics, you're still on a gradual path. And so that's, um, you know, I think that's, that's the message of this book because that's, I think, the message for the more ordinary people out there that aren't a spontaneously well-trained meditator, like a well-trained self-taught chef, there is a reproducible curricula that you can follow that will help lead you to not a big epiphany, but small, incremental, modest breakthroughs where you mature. I mean, I didn't have a mind blower in 22 years of the path that I've been following. But if I turn my head back and I look back at the trail that I followed, I can say, oh, I've definitely grown. I've definitely opened my heart. I've definitely seen amazing things that make me believe 
that I'm more than just my body and that I have a deeper purpose and that there's more to life than meets the eye in the Western secular, you know, hierarchy of trajectory of climbing the corporate ladder. So those things have blossomed. So there has been minor awakenings. Are they anything to write home about? Am I ever going to make the top, you know, newspaper article about the celebrity who's had a mind blowing experience like Eckhart Tolle? No, it's modest and it's unsensational and it's probably unsexy, but it is possible for, for most of us to have that if you're willing to commit and do the work and follow a process that could mean the rest of your life. And that's the hard sell, I would say. That's the hard thing. The pitch is, you know, this was not an easy book to get to, 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 to lift. I had the support of the publisher, but there was... Many conversations early on with Sounds True that this was not going to be a hot, sensational, sexy kind of topic. Uh, this wasn't going to be... <laughs> well, just by the, the, the nature of the title alone, it's, it's, a, it's a tough sell. To me, it was intriguing because my process has been very gradual and I've, I've loved how it's unfolded and continue to do so. But for someone who is selling books or a publicist that's putting you on a book tour, I imagine calling something gradual in essence, is not great for marketing, right? It sucks like if you were for to, If you would have called your book like Sudden Huge Global Impact <laughs> Awakening, like in five minutes or five easy steps, exactly. you know, you, you'd have something more in your hands. But I think for the more discerning, perhaps, uh, seeker that has already had the experience of that graduality, is that a word, graduality, uh, of the gradual nature of, you know, our own individual evolution that, to me, as I said, that was a hook. I was like, oh, yeah, duh, of course. Great title. This is going to be a great book. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah and, you've, um, and, and you've been around the block, so maybe that you know that the marketing pitches have not really yielded what they say they're going to yield. This I is mean, true. just because you can fit it in a three-part sequence and put it on the cover of Cosmo magazine, it doesn't mean that it yields what it promises. You know, so now we're going to get into the mindfulness territory. Yes. Um, well, I want to I wanna unpack a couple things that you talked about first, and this is great, and... Uh, Oh, there's just, there's so much here. Uh, in terms of that, that gradual path of little unfolding things as um, realizations as they unfold gradually. So I talked about when I went to India, I was really hoping for that big blast. I wanted that Eckhart Tolle sitting on the bench in the mm -hmm. park and all of a sudden your entire reality is transformed. Uh, that didn't happen, but it ended up being part of the journey. And I think it's interesting what you pointed out that even for those rare instances um, that are reported subjectively by the people who have those sudden awakenings, they also um, universally report that there is a period of integration for them to like reestablish their place in space and time and still manage to function. Uh, David R. Hawkins is another one of my favorite teachers who comes to mind. And he had a gradual process punctuated by a few huge awakenings. And after each awakening, had to kind of step back from everything his practice he was a um, psychiatrist here in new york city for 50 years or in long island and uh he would just have to disappear and kind of go whoa what just happened and then re-emerge and be able to sort of uh, contextualize that into a teaching and things that he could then share mm. uh, but i think in the gradual awakening path uh, it lends itself more to the sharing because you can sort of pick people up on your journey as you go uh, as they are so aligned with your development at that moment. Mm -hmm. So five years ago, I might have been able to share some of my experiences and insights at that point, which would have been relevant to people at that stage of the journey mm -hmm. and so on and so on, right? Yes, exactly. W whereas if you do have that big sudden like, whoa, I'm enlightened, then I, you're almost like unattainable to the average person in a sense because you could come from the zoomed out perspective of like, nothing you see is real anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind of thing. How do you explain that to someone who's like, I meditated once. It's too, it's too big of a leap. Yeah, that's a very astute observation. And it really speaks to the, the sophistication with the model that the Tibetans present in this. It's, it's, it's more than just gradual. There's a sequential curricula. And just as you astutely said... You might need certain tools and insights and principles at early stages in your development. And once you have a certain re realization, you don't step off the map claiming you're Jesus. You then migrate or transition to another level of development 
in which you might not need earlier tools, but you might need something else. And then you can continue this way where commensurate with where you are developmentally, you might let go of certain tools or principles that at the time were really important in your development, and now you're looking at a different set of technologies or tools. And I think this is really important given where we are in the United States and in Western culture right now, because it's very clear to see just how much of a smorgasbord in our spiritual marketplace we have so many tools available to us, right? We are at a convergence unlike any other in human history where you can walk down New York City and in one set of streets, you can go into a yoga center and do Kundalini. You can go into the next place and do Dzogchen Mahamudra. You can go to the next place and do chanting prayers and you can go mindfulness, secular versions of mindfulness. And you can, you know, you can have the latest uh, compassion training and suddenly you have so much available. And the average, I don't want to call it consumer, but the average spiritual aspirant might be wondering, well, how do these all relate? And how do they, you know, wh what's good for me? And what do I need? And, and, and without a developmental model, which is presented in the gradual approach, you could be totally lost just trying to mix and match and wing it. But if you, the minute you start to see the architecture of the roadmap, you start to see that certain principles and certain practices are useful in the beginning. Others are useful in the middle stages and others still are very useful towards the end of the path. And once you get that, then you avoid the pitfalls of overindulging and getting sidetracked and trying to do too much with, with, with techniques and technologies that might not be appropriate to where you are. And so that roadmap, just like a uh, GPS setting in your car, if you're trying to drive from New York City to LA, you could probably make it there winging it. Or you could just be very smart about it and say, well, this is this is the direct path and this, this is the territory that I'm going to traverse and these are the guidelines and principles that are important to where I am right now. And then the minute you cross, you know, Kentucky, you might need a different setting to get around or you might need a different condition or you might need a different circumstance, a set of tools, you know, maybe the weather changes or whatever. And, and, and that's a little bit of what the gradual path curriculum affords modern people is the big bird's eye map of the road to enlightenment. And I'm not one that has reached the goal. I'm one that has just enjoyed the fruits of at least knowing where I am and where I'm going. You know, I'm not really that hungry as I was to sort of have this liberation anymore. I believe liberation is possible because I've surrounded myself with amazing people who have tasted it and embody it without telling me they have. But on the same point, I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of okay just being where I am and working with, within the parameters and trying to edge my way a little further to be a little more humble, a little kinder, a little more intelligent about how I use my time, etc. And so I think that's like, to me... If you go into Amazon and you start buying books, you might lose sight of the grand architecture of how these little books, you get Sharon Salzberg's Loving Kindness, and you get Sass de Simone's like five-minute meditations, and you get some power tools like Tantra, and suddenly you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Where do the, How do these fit? And how am I supposed to practice all of them? And what's right for me right now, you know? And so that's, I think, a really helpful way to look at, you know, so what, what are the, what are they? What are the major milestones that are set out in the gradual path in this book? The first one's an obvious one. It's where you and I started. It's about taking care of yourself. There are certain principles and certain practices that are designed to help you get unstuck from your addictions from your, um, you know, afflictions, whether they be pride or hatred or greed or whatever, the places where we get stuck, first we need to know that we are inherently not stuck and that there are ways to help loosen and galvanize the amazing potential of everybody's mind to help you feel like you could be in control of your life again. Then you arrive at a place where you feel some confidence. Maybe you're not fully liberated, but maybe you also have a sense of confidence. Like maybe you're not a Michael Jordan level basketball player, but you know how to dribble and shoot the ball. You know what I mean? And once you have that, 
Then the second milestone, the second leg of the journey is, wait, I discovered this really profound thing that I'm not who I think I am. I'm not this depressed, worthless, son of a bitch, sack of shit that I think I am. I'm actually a powerful human being, exactly no different than the masters that I admire. I'm just a little lost and confused about who I really am. And the masters help you taste your possibility. In that proximity with my first teacher, in his presence, I tasted love. And that wasn't because he was giving it to me. He was allowing me to taste it in myself, that it was possible for me. And even though it was just one drop, the well was inside of me. And I could return to the well and turn the drop into a cup of water. And I'm still in the process of finding a way to make that really flow, like really tap the flow of the nectar that's in the heart. But then you turn around and you start to discover, okay, I am an incredible human being. I've tasted some of the nectar of my own possibility. I still have a long way to go, but I have growing confidence that it's possible for me and that this should be the purpose of my life not messing around on the corporate ladder or the work, you know, the, the fashion work wheel. <laughs> but what sure. about everybody else? Oh my God, I'm not in a mountain hermitage. I'm not in the Himalaya in a cave. I have kids. I have a wife. I have colleagues. I have students. I have clients. I live in the, the heart of the beast here in New York City. I have to get through the subway at rush hour. And suddenly it's really clear that people don't know how powerful they are and people are really confused and misguided about who they are and they're suffering and they're having a really hard time and they're taking their hard time out on me. (laughs) So what do we do for them? So suddenly your little apparatus, your practice is not enough to help other people. Other people, surviving other people's toxicity and their ambivalence and their apathy and their narcissism and their aggression, suddenly you graduate past a very thin threshold that's like a blurred threshold. It's not like you graduate and can't come back. You vacillate past this threshold between I have to take care of myself and then what about all these other people? Suddenly there becomes a whole new curriculum in this middle stage of the path about how to keep your heart open with people who hate you and are prejudiced against you and are totally driven by their urges and their instincts and and are 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 just hell bent on destroying the planet for example. Suddenly you have to you have to get a different kind of scuba gear on to deal with these people. Uh, <laughs> spiritual scuba gear. Exactly. <laughs> I'm yeah. going down in the depths. And and that's what the Dalai Lama teaches. I mean, he's a friendly little monk. He's a, just a simple Buddhist monk, he says. Um, but he's teaching some of the most profound practices to a secular society about how do we live with each other? How do we, how do we have more compassion for each other? How do we understand each other? How do we have greater empathy and understanding for each other and all the multiplicities of religious views and intolerance and bigotry and hatred and misogyny? How do we live together and how do we deal with people? Well, you need more than simple mindfulness for that. You need a whole other set of teachings. So that's the what's called the middle scope. And then you, again, go past a blurry line, a threshold, and you graduate to this a quantum level of analysis where you adopt a wisdom training. And wisdom training is exactly that. It helps you see the deep nature of reality. Uh, Right now I see all of this machinery that's capturing mind moments and dispersing it out into the biosphere, right? And you look over there like like you're a very attractive uh, 48-year-old man and you're over there and I'm over here and we're sitting in a hotel room and it's all hitting our brains as if it's like really concretely exactly the way that it appears to the mind. Oh, my New York hands just hit the microphone. And uh, <clears throat> and that are, that is a complete deception. And anyone who has, you know, dabbled in ayahuasca knows that it's a deception. It is, it is not a total lie, but it is a deception. It's not a complete truth. It's not a complete truth. Exactly. It's a relative truth. But it, but most of us don't know that. And as long as we don't know that, we are obscured from the nature of reality. And, and because of that obscuration, like two billiard balls bouncing up off each other, we are ricocheting against reality because our nervous system 
can only read and interpret reality in one way, in this kind of concrete atomic way. And Which is, is the, w- the way of duality. So I see that as that person as other, they're from a different tribe, they're other, and I'm unable to see and not just see, but perceive in a meaningful way that there is an actual oneness and connection there. And that the material reality that we're experiencing now in this room and everywhere else is only that way because of one particular perception through our nervous system. That's exactly right. Okay, cool. So that's what I'm calling quantum view, which is right right now the nervous system operates in the Newtonian world. Uh, Matter is matter and hard and concrete. And if it's hard and concrete and I want it, I can own it. And if I don't want it, I can kill someone over it. And that's how we operate. The minute that you can infer, which is to transcend your biology and use a state of consciousness that can look past what the appearances hitting the nervous system are suggesting to the brain. Once you can infer and go, that bit of real estate over there is just an appearance. In the the course of this conversation, the oxygen in your lungs have, have also entered my lungs. And so whatever you felt was over there as you is actually also me. And whatever bit of real estate that's over there that you can put your flag in saying, this I claim for the United States with a star-spangled banner, you can't find it the way that your brain suggests it. So you drop into a kind of matrix, uh, a, a, a world that is synonymous with appearance, there is also what's called emptiness. And that doesn't mean vacuum, it just means openness. So there's openness and simultaneously appearance. In fact, if you just put a hyphen between the two of them and think of them as one reality, now you have non-duality, openness appearance, or what the Buddhists call emptiness appearance. And there's a big mistake where people, and because our brain is conditioned to go bilateral, we can just think that things are exactly how they appear, which is the normal, ordinary state of consciousness condition, which leads to desire and aggression and creates karma, and then creates a life of traumatic experience. Or you can have a meditative experience just like having ayahuasca where everything melts and you go into the oneness. And then you're closer to truth, but you there's a danger there of going, well, then it's all one. The world of appearance is an illusion. Now that's dangerous. That's dangerous and you know some people start going, oh, well, the war in Syria is just an illusion. Oh, the ice caps melting, that's just an illusion. That's dangerous thinking, isn't it? Well, it's it's funny because as you say that, uh, I would say I fall more in that category. Uh, I don't tend to get too caught up in the, you the, know, the the minutia. minutia. Yeah, it, exactly. I was actually thinking about this this morning, and I was sort of, I was thinking about there's this George Carlin bit where he talks about the naivete of humans being like, I'm going to save the world. I'm yeah. going to save the planet. I don't know yeah, if you've yeah. seen it. It's, I think personally brilliant for one perspective, although it's maybe kind of a bleak outlook uh, from another is that I was, I was kind of zooming out on planet earth and I was thinking about ecological issues and political issues and things like that. And how so many of us get so caught up in like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to fight because we care, you know, which is beautiful. Uh, but we toil around oftentimes, I think not realizing that, the universe god planet all of that sort of has its own agenda that's somewhat impervious to humans and that all life on earth is almost like a bacterial film on the face of earth (laughs) and that we think as that bacteria that's covering the planet that it can't sort of take care of itself and that in the great scheme of things there's Mm -hmm. probably an endless number of earths and versions of it in other dimensions and this one Mm -hmm. and that you know we can get so caught up in sort of the social justice uh, injustices and things like that, that we lose track of like, well, let me just clean up my own side of the street and get along with my immediate family, forgive the people I know and just kind of keep it simple, you know, and uh, keeping your own side of the street clean, so to speak. And then, and then proceeding from there. Um, so it, it, it is a fine line. And I do find myself more like, okay, kids, like, fight in the sandbox. There's a bigger picture here. That's not to say though, that I don't care. Uh, I recycle. I don't litter. I turn all the lights off when I leave a room. You know what I mean? I've considered myself to be fairly conscientious, but I also know that mm, we only have a certain amount of impact. Yep. And that to me, what I find most useful is keeping that impact pretty close to home. And it's, you know, I do my podcast. I reach thousands of people doing that. Uh, hopefully that has an impact. 
but it's more like the impact I'm going to have with you today and Valerie sitting here in the front desk when I ask for some help on something, you know, it's like transformational work, just piecemeal and gradual as I go rather than going out and trying to change the world. Yeah. And I think that's probably what we would call in Buddhism. That's called a skillful means. It's like a, the way that you're trying to make your impact is commensurate with your capacity and you're not trying to bite off more than you can chew because if you do, maybe you become less tolerant or you become more discouraged or whatever. Your your capacity to be effective gets tarnished in a way. Yeah, and I don't want to get caught up in a little scuffle over here and kind of miss the big picture. Right. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be at the bus stop arguing about Democrats and Republicans. It's like there's a way bigger <laughs> mission at hand than that myopic approach to it. Yeah. Although there are uh, there are people who I think are qualified and well suited to have those battles. It just I don't think that's my battle. Well, you know? I, I agree, and I think like someone like the Dalai Lama, for example, is not kicking back, smoking a cigar, going it's all one and it's all okay. <laughs> right, right. I think he takes on the burden of being involved and engaged relentlessly, holding a Mick Jagger, you know, tour schedule of teaching living beings how to live with har- in, in harmony and peace. Because he has avoided the extremes of, go, of falling prey to the fact that it's all concrete and unchangeable and not falling prey to the other extreme where he misunderstands emptiness or oneness to, to devalue the relative complexities of our situation. In other words, he's right there dancing in the middle where he keeps his nervous system buoyant and effective But he knows there's issues and struggles to deal with. And so he's trying to bring the best nervous system into the matrix in order to have maximal impact. And for you, you're trying to bring your best nervous system into your conversation with me, which I appreciate. I can feel it. I feel engaged. I feel motivated. It, it, it's having a tuning fork effect on me. It does maybe with the receptionist when you go down to the lobby it will spread through the impact of your social media platform. So that integrity is felt as a resonant circuitry. But let's also not be naive that you're 48 and maybe as you proceed along your gradual path, your nervous system also expands and your capability, confidence, and capacity also upgrades so that you are actually able to take take on a bigger chunk of the issue or the burden with more effectiveness and more tact and more grace and more skillfulness in the way that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is, for example, just as an example, there are many others, you know. So that's also possible. And I, I guess we were talking about it in terms of the milestones of the map of the gradual path. We take care of ourselves first. We then start taking care of our immediate family. We upgrade our capacity to be mindful to our own addictions and and generate a sense of mastery over our own mind. But then we empower others through compassion and love to remind them of their own innate resources. And then not to get trapped there, there is this final leg of the journey, which is to have this quantum level of view, which you definitely need if you're going to be engaged. Otherwise, you can too easily fall into the trap of getting overloaded by the minutia and overloaded by the sheer magnitude of the suffering on this planet and the powerlessness that there's like, you know, hungry, demon, demonic uh, political forces that are so um, egregious and that have so much power. What can little old me do? And so many millions of people that are without food and etc. Suddenly you can get so overwhelmed and without that level of openness to start to see no everything everything is uh, changeable everything is relative things have much more fluidity even if it takes longer than we are patient enough to to endure things can shift the berlin wall does fall it does eventually fall you know we can we can reverse climate uh, impact we can definitely do that uh every part every um obstacle that is presenting itself to our mind that feels so overwhelming and causes a sense of powerlessness, the quantum view of reality helps keep us engaged and always reminds us that possibility is at hand. 
Yeah, so there's a, I guess, a sense of balance there where you're acknowledging both sides of reality then. Exactly. That's what's called a true non-dualism. That's what's called the middle way. Okay, and I critique it in my book. There's a lot of talk about non-dualism, non-dual meaning not to, okay? And there is this tendency in pop culture to assume that the not to means that the relative world is bogus and the world of oneness is what's real, when you drop acid and everything melts and the world of oneness opens to your mind, then you start thinking, oh, the relative world of having a job and a body and having to like interact with my wife or husband or partner, that's all an illusion. Syria is an illusion. The ice caps are an illusion. It's all one, so it's all good. From a Buddhist perspective, that's called a dangerous oneness. And one of my teachers, Bob Thurman, likes to call it cheap non-dualism. Because it's kind of too easy. Yeah. It's too easy. Yeah. Uh, so what's the what what is the real not to is that oneness and relativity are actually two sides of the same coin. How do you toggle your mind until they become emptiness dash relativity or appearance? It's one word, openness appearance. Not two. It's one thing. It's both empty and appears. You have to hold both of them. That creates a level of cognitive dissonance that most people can't tolerate unless they train themselves to align with that. Uh, so that's what the the last leg of the journey is, is cultivating uh, the ability to tolerate that things are both appearing and yet are open at the same time, at the same time. You know, that bed, that person, I can read you as an entity, an external entity, an other and yet intuitively I know we're one, and I don't have to jettison one for the other. I don't have to fall prey to this habit of my mind that goes bilateral, one or the other. I can hold them together. And that's what we're talking about as a middle way. That's, that's, that's what real reality, according to the Buddhists, if we could see the world that way, we'd be able to see its open potential and yet, and yet dance with it. Right. Wow, and, that's, that's, oh man, that is amazing because... It's like in the in the concrete, uh, stark extremes of both of those, you have the materialist, right? Who's in the Newtonian paradigm, everything that's physical is real. There is no God. Spirituality is bullshit. You just need to get yours and be physically secure in that kind of animal lower nature, even if you're a relatively good person. And then you have the spiritual aspirant who does the plant medicine or does whatever kind of sort of escapist version of that and then becomes a renunciate and moves out to Sedona and gives up all their shit, you know, and says that none of this is real and, and becomes ineffective back in the material plane. So it's, it's interesting you, on, you got it on both you sides. Totally of that. got That's it. amazing. Yeah. I've never, I mean, I contemplate such things and I discuss such things, but uh, I'm always trying to sort of mm, find my own equanimity within that. Am I not a great person because I'm not fighting for causes and am I taking the easy way out? Cause I'm just like, Let's love our immediate people, try to forgive ourselves, try to forgive them, just go from there. Like, don't get too big for your britches, spirituality. Um, Healthy dose of humility, that sounds like to me. <laughs> well, so, but, you know, I am always, and, and it's a moving target finding that balance, too, because what was appropriate in my development at a certain stage would have been way more uh, recessed from other much more internalized, looking at kind of the first part of your path you talked about of really looking at the blocks, you know, looking at the traps, looking at the sticky places where I get stuck in ego and all that. So there is this sort of self-centered, egocentric, um, you know, uh, self-observational phase of development where you really have to kind of see all those parts of yourself before you can even pull your head out of your ass enough to affect any sort of change, right? Mm. Um, so I love that you've enunciated the different stages of it because as I kind of stumble through them, it's only in retrospect that I look back and go, ah, okay, that was appropriate for that time, staying alone all day and meditating and doing all that and not really interacting with the world or sharing those. But now, uh, which brings me kind of to one of the next things I want to talk to him is this radical altruism, mm. which for me means like having a podcast, doing some workshops, doing some talks 
going into the bodega and looking that person in the eyes and sincerely, not to be a do-gooder, but sincerely thanking them for ringing up my freaking Reese's Pieces or whatever, you know. Mm. Oh, I'm not supposed to admit I eat those. It's a health podcast also. But, uh, you know, last night I think it was some organic uh, Reese's cups, you know. <laughs> so I was thinking of. But uh, I think they didn't have hydrogenated oil in them, though, so they were okay. Um, but it's like now I'm, I have a sense of um, uh, purpose that is enabling me to do more good out there. And I'm less sort of self-absorbed, hopefully in like fixing myself because my ass is not on fire. Like it used to be. I'm not, I don't wake up wanting to cut myself or drink or do anything self-destructive. And in fact, my outward behavior gradually has become less self or other destructive, Mm. destructive as I go. So there's room now to kind of get out of myself and not be so, um, self-centered and self-focused even on the positive sense and go like, oh, wow, I actually have, my heart is open, as you said, and I, I do have the capacity to share a really high level of love a lot of the time. Hmm. Not all the time. Sometimes I walk out of here and I'm irritable as shit and I'm just hmm. like, everyone stay away from me. Mm-hmm. But those those are becoming less frequent and shorter in duration, those periods of like that negative orientation to the world and to having this physical experience it's more uh, fluid and balanced. It's really amazing. So what is this radical altruism? How does that play out in the stage where we have enough of our own, uh, you know, resources and um, an, enough contact with the spiritual realm and enough acceptance and understanding of the material realm that we can now navigate through and do good? Yeah, I mean, radical altruism is a way of discussing what in the tradition is called bodhicitta, bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is the vow you take as a spiritual aspirant, as a spiritual practitioner, once you have graduated past the threshold of your own, taking care of your own mind, acknowledging that the purpose of your life is not to buy more shit. The purpose of your life is to maximize your own good qualities. Once you cross the threshold of realizing it's not just about you, you have an opportunity then to live for others. And there's a very wonderful, beautiful way of articulating it. I don't just live for me, I live for others. I don't just live for now, I live for all future lives. I don't just live for happiness, I live for the supreme happiness of liberation. So that really is the epitome or the central principle of the bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is the archetype of the individual who sees themselves embedded in the matrix of life and whose sole purpose is to illuminate their mind in order to be maximally effective to awakening others to their own innate potential. And the archetype, the embodiment of that, of course, is the Dalai Lama, who is chosen to be amongst people and not in a hermitage in order to teach them not to prostatize them and not to convert them, but to help awaken them to their own innate capacity. And his sole obligation, purpose, drive, motivation, what makes him tick is to be connected with them and to make as many relations as possible and to help illuminate for people that they have this innate power. And so that is not just for a few people. That's something we can all... It's almost like this. This will get a little bit into the critique of my book is modern materialism has made its imprint on us that we have a particular trajectory in life, a purpose. And that purpose is, as you know, to look good, to gain wealth, to be successful, to receive as much praise as you can have, and to have as many pleasures as possible. (laughs) Yeah, I know that path. (laughs) <laughs> Especially the latter bullet point, yes. yeah. And that's all she wrote. That is the modus operandi of the secular Western industrial mentality. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. That's the game. That's the whole game. From cradle to grave, seeking as many pleasurable experiences and amassing as much praise and amassing much wealth and as, as many cars and houses and experiences as you can before you die. And that is all contained or hinged upon a nihilistic paradigm, one in which 
there's no beginning or there's a, there's a beginning at conception and there's an end when the brain activity, uh, the electric activity in your brain diminishes at death. That's all she wrote folks. So get it on. Based on that, based on that, uh, presupposition, that's actually a good plan. If, you know, if that's your paradigm, the plan you just laid out is like, oh yeah, duh, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Take that 80 years and bang it out and, and that's go all you got. It. Go and go and get it, get it on. Right. Right. Um, but it's ex- from a Buddhist perspective, it's extremely sad. It's actually a very sad condition uh, because it fails to recognize who you really are, that you're not just one life. You have multiple lives. You're a soul that's tr- that's inhabiting uh, form uh, and that you have much greater purpose than accumulating wealth and acquisitions and uh, uh, pleasurable experiences and that you don't recognize that you're creating causes and conditions that will determine your future life. And so it's a it's from a Buddhist perspective, our current predicament as Western secular modern industrial society hinged upon nihilism is actually a um, an anorexic, a severely, severely scarce mentality that is actually uh, creating its own degeneration or de-evolution. We're actually devolving from that perspective because we don't recognize that the things that we do while we're grabbing and obtaining and, 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 and fighting off and defending, we don't realize that we're actually contaminating a perfectly amazing life and we're actually setting ourselves up for a devolution. That's, so, from, that's from a Buddhist uh, perspective. That's See, this is so interesting because I admittedly uh, know very little about Buddhism. I mean, I've interviewed Sharon Salzberg, uh, Diego, um, a young Pueblo, as he's known, a, you know, a couple of luminaries. Uh, but I don't know a lot about it. But every single thing you've said so far and everything I've read so far, I'm like, yeah, duh, of course. I mean, it's like in perfect alignment with how I managed to contextualize life up until this point. Well, spread the message, man. <laughs> spread it far and wide. You're more than matter. You're more than matter. And you've been searching. If you found your way to this podcast, you're a searcher. You're a seeker. You haven't been fooled by corporate capitalism and marketing ploys that are hell-bent on having you consume and forcing you to produce. If you found your way to this podcast, there's some illuminated part of your mind that recognizes that you are more than this, but you have been indoctrinated into a corporate uh, mentality that is impoverished. It is impoverishing you from accessing a greater purpose and a greater meaning. And you're wasting your life from a Buddhist point of view. This is a waste, a, a very sad predicament, a waste of a life. So not only in the first leg of the journey do you reclaim your humanity by understanding that because you have mind and consciousness is uh, not parsed, is not contained within one lifetime, and that the things we say, think, and do in this lifetime are actually setting up a future life, and that 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 life is a continuum that has no, no beginning and no end. It's infinite, truly infinite, truly quantum. I mean, quantum before quantum. The, the Tibetans, they were quantum, the Buddhists were quantum before quantum. And, uh, uh, but to reclaim mastery of your evolution, that's the game. That's the game. Don't, don't waste your time, illuminate your qualities, and maximize your inner resources. Instead of having to grasp out there, there's a well here that could, so, so definitely abundance here that could feed you. But then we were talking about the bodhisattva, which is then to recognize, shit, look at everybody, how sad a predicament everybody's like frenetically trying to buy on Amazon on their little phone, and yet they go home so depressed that they're popping Prozac and like sleeping pills and like pornifying themselves, trying to grab the next like orgasm, right? It's a really sad condition. So the Bodhisattva says, well, I'm not, I'm, I found a little internal peace and I see the open nature of reality, but I'm not going to forget my brothers and sisters who are sleepwalking through life and having a nightmare and believing their nightmare. Right. right. Believing their nightmare. So I'm committed to them and I'm not going to knock on a door and give them a Bible and beat it into their head. I'm going to make myself available with my embodiment so that those that are interested can come forward and learn what they are really about. And once you do that, once you make your commitment to stay amongst people 
and to offer what you can. It might immediately be resources. I'll give them a podcast. I'll give them a winter coat. I'll give them a, a warm meal in the, in the winter. Uh, then it might graduate. I'll give you a place, a shelter. You know, if you're in a dire situation, you come into my house or you come into my circle or you come into my therapy office or you come into my coaching practice. But the highest gift that we can give is the teachings on who you really are, that you're a powerful being. You are migrating through consciousness. You are being tr driven by instincts. You can override those instincts. You can maximize potentials of love and compassion. You are an amazing, supreme human being. And once you arrive there with that recognition, then and then finally you can have purpose. What is the purpose of your life is to help everybody actualize their nature. And God damn it, what a relief that is to finally discover that. Because think about what has been motivating you for 10, 20, 30 years of your life as a central as a central uh, as a central axis mundi of your orientation of your, you know, your your thrust in life has been self-serving. It has been all self-serving. It's enough for me to cry like I am included in this. The waking hours of our life are really secretly or overtly about us. And that's why we're not happy. And when you discover that you can be happy and the way that you do that is to erode your core orientation, your axis around the meanness and you start celebrating that you're my brother. I, even though I just met you, you are my brother. You are my sister. We are in this together. We are in a lifeboat floating through evolution together. And it's got several punctures. And our purpose is to save each other and to help each other realize we're safe. And we are home. And we have everything we need. And that doesn't mean like... You've got to stop being a stylist or stop putting out your podcast or I have to stop being a therapist. No, it means inhabiting those roles driven by a new agenda. Because you can be a therapist going, look how good I am with my clients or look how much money I made or look at like I made it onto Luke's podcast or whatever, right? You can still you can do that and, and it looks like you're being uh, connected and collaborative but really, it's still the same orientation is still operating. The me, the me program is still operating. But when you get to this radical altruism, it's like a new setting that provides so much relief because it reshapes life as you know it. It reshapes life as you know it. I was just in India with my teacher, and we have a ceremony that I, I, I brought 32 of my students to Nepal. I'm sorry, it was to Nepal, Nepal this time, just arrived two days ago. And I had 32 of my students, and I'm not the main teacher. I'm the ferry boatman. I bring my students to meet the masters, to meet the people who have evolved. I see that as my responsibility, and I'm honored to do it. And after several weeks of teachings, we had a bodhisattva ceremony, which is the vow or commitment ceremony at a holy shrine with a great master that people adopt certain principles and certain guidelines about how they're going to live the rest of their life as someone who has who is interested in turning their heart inside out to live for others. And I will never forget it as long as I live. Geshe Tenzin Zopa told everybody, he told everybody, for countless lives your soul has been lost and today your soul's purpose has been actualized. It's not at some distant future where you're going to fulfill your purpose. You know, like we're long, longingly climbing up the mountain and we'll get to the summit one day. You have actualized your, your life's purpose. You have already actualized it by taking this vow to commit the rest of your life to live inside out for the benefit of others. You have finally, finally actualized your life's purpose. And I was just blown away. I was blown away. And that doesn't mean all 32 students come home and they give up their jobs and they wear loincloths and they start doing mantras. And, you know, it doesn't mean that. It means like half of them were therapists. Boom! Suddenly bodhisattva therapists have infiltrated their offices with love and compassion. Some of them are CEOs and executives in the in the leadership and, and finance field. Boom! Suddenly a bodhisattva is infiltrating finance. Some of them are school teachers. Boom! Suddenly a bodhisattva is infiltrating the, the uh, educational system. System. And and their presence, their mentality, 
is reversing the narcissistic paradigm and the agenda of capitalism and production that is making us so sick and disturbed. And that's their, that's all they can do, just like you said, that you work within your sphere of influence, but now finally you have a meaningful purpose to your life. On the outside, nothing has changed. Miles, if that microphone on your head didn't cost $199 on Amazon, I would throw it on the goddamn floor right now. And the biggest <laughs> mic drop ever recorded. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, amazing. This is one of those ones I'm definitely... I don't listen back to my shows that much anymore because after doing that for the first year, I realized that it just... You know, I, I was doing it so that I could improve my delivery and my uh, execution of the show. And I listened to enough, I think, to know what my shortcomings are and what my strengths are. And I'm just leaning towards those strengths. But this one I will probably listen to again. There's another thing about that stage of the path that came to mind. And that is once you've zoomed out and you have that perspective of both paradigms of reality actually being that true oneness, that that's the true non-duality is that there is a dualness and they're both valid and you can kind of play within both those realms um, is that, contextualizing my life as sort of uh, a scene in a very long movie and this one lifetime for a hundred years or whatever it is, it's just a blip of one scene in this long movie of God knows how many lifetimes to come, right? It's, it's the purpose that we've discussed and having a way uh, to give life meaning. But for me, there's a huge relief in knowing that uh, any pain, any suffering along the way actually has a purpose. And that if I can go through these periods of, of discomfort and these periods of sort of shedding my old skin and going like, oh, God, I feel naked and vulnerable, and then learning how to acclimate to that next level, that there's a purpose in that. And so the divorce, the scratched car, the delayed flight, the someone stepping on your toe when you were not wearing shoes in New York City, the, the things... Uh, that it's okay. It's like they're not that serious because I know that, oh, cool, this is an opportunity to grow. And then when I get past that, it's likely, and this is just this has been my experience within this blip of a lifetime, is that if I take those painful experiences and I do turn them into a lesson, meaning I use them as, as grist for the mill and I change and evolve, I really don't have to go through them anymore. Mm. You know, it's like I was an alcoholic and I eventually <laughs> was able to stop doing that and now it's very unlikely that I'll repeat that pattern in this lifetime and probably not in the ones to come. Mm. Who knows how many times I went through that before. So it's like I don't regret it. I see the value in it, but it's kind of a relief. I sort of like brush that one off my shoulder like, whew, okay, got through that one. Or whether it's, you know, attachments or aversions or anything that we have to kind of work through. To me, it's such a relief when I get through something like that because I go, cool, pass that lesson on to the next one and knowing that I'm going to reap the benefits off into the future or possible eternity and that now I own that experience and, um, and I've, I've earned that. You know, I've sort of earned my stripes at that next level and gamifying my lifetime in terms of a, a reincarnation cycle to me makes it all make sense and it's worth it to go through some discomfort. And oftentimes even seeking situations in which I feel really uncomfortable because I'm growing and knowing like, no, nah, no, this is part of my training. It's like a spiritual Navy SEAL mm. kind of training that I'm putting myself through so that I don't take the pain uh, or the optional suffering so seriously. It's like, okay, I just need to sit and, and just deal with this and feel this, not try to escape it, feel whatever it is I'm experiencing, knowing that it is going to pass, and then I'll have that in my toolbox. Oh, I know this situation. I know how to deal with this. It really is, um, I don't know how anyone could live a life and not have that sort of worldview, you know, just on the reincarnation and the karma. And I, and I wanted to talk to you about karma too, um, if you could cover it, please, in a minute and a half. Uh, no, is that I think many of us view these lessons, these karmic lessons, um, in that, <laughs> there's only negative karma. Mm. It's like, oh, I'm going to be a good person because I don't want that shit to come back to me in this lifetime or another. But how about having this radical altruism as a, as a means by which we live our life, as you just so eloquently described, that I'm actually earning merit and earning positive karma mm. to enjoy not only the rest of this life, but those to come. You know, So that one little random act of kindness is, is so valuable 
because it's almost like it is, well, it's not almost, it is serving self while you're serving other. Exactly. So could you maybe give us a little bit on your, on your view of karma, both, you know, the negative of kind of reaping what you sow, uh, and then in the positive sense too, that you're, in other words, like if you, if you punch someone, you're literally punching yourself at that very moment. And if you give someone a hug, you're hugging yourself, that kind of thing. Car- karma is indispensable from the Buddhist teaching. So, you know, as opposed to mindfulness and secular forms of meditation, where meditation has been extracted like a mineral out of the mind, karma is so central to understanding how meditation is used in this context that you're describing. I'm so, like, relieved in a way that I'm talking to you and that you have this perspective already. Like, if I, I, To me, I find that, you know, some it would raise eyebrows for some, and for me, I find it a sign of maturity that you're so able to um, align yourself to the fact that you are inhabiting form after already having countless lives and that you have certain obstacles that you're here to master and overcome. And that once you embrace those things rather than uh, 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 putting your effort towards external accolades and achievements, you're what's called making good on your precious human life by maximizing your own resources to overcome self-imposed obstacles that you have created in the past. And the sense of liberation that you're talking about when like, I don't have to deal with addiction anymore and maybe I'll never have to deal with it again is like a life well spent, brother. And we should fucking goddamn celebrate you because it's no small fucking feat. If you and I sit and we can count on both our hands of people we know who have died because of addiction... And the great sadness that addiction causes with families whose members have died because of addiction. It's no fucking joke. And so it's a huge fucking thing that you have overcome that thing. It's huge. You could have been dead right now. You know? Fucking dead in the goddamn street. And you used your life, and it's no small thing. And like you should feel incredible amounts of privilege and honor and celebratory uh, sentiment that you did it. You did it. You lose. You used your precious human life to accomplish something very profound that is not just for now, but for later. That delay of gratification, the grips of your addiction was all about the now, and your ability to use your mind to sever that modus has freed you for a future moment. You can probably enjoy the rest of your life not being compelled by that addiction. And that's the literal addiction of substance abuse. But in a way, from the Buddhist perspective, that is the human condition. We are all caught in the grips of some compulsive, deeply, deeply compulsive way of being. And our purpose is to use our mind to sever that drive in order to access something far deeper that provides exactly what you talk about, a modicum of relief. And then you can go, God, in this one, I use this one. I finally use this one to my benefit. And then you can go, well, how do I use it to other people's benefit? And see, you have something that you can teach that I can't teach because I never had addiction in my life. You can sit down with clients that come into your spiritual coaching process and you can have empathy with them and you can be a resource for them and you can be an inspiration for them and you can help them channel their, you know, last little bit of fuel in the fuel tank towards having a meaningful existence. All of this hinges on karma. Your original question was, what is karma? Karma just means cause and effect. It means action. It means every intention that we have drives us in physically to have behavior. And behavior doesn't just stop. It doesn't just stop and into the ether. That's the problem with the Newtonian worldview is like, I can say something nasty to you and leave the room and it doesn't just stop there. It continues. It has an imprint on you, but it has an imprint on me. Everything I do is creating an imprint on my consciousness. It's not a boomerang where I throw it. If I'm mean to you and I walk out that door and someone hits me and that's my karma, what goes around comes around. It's not like that. The what goes around comes around is all subjective. If I harbor animosity and I harbor ill will and I harbor arrogance, I'm contaminating, making dozens and dozens of dozens of imprints like thumb in clay that harden in my mind. And in a future moment, I will receive data points from reality that will be conditioned by these imprints for me to feel a subjective experience of impoverishment, 
for example. So being stingy and being desirous and being greedy and being nasty, it looks like in the immediate environment that we get away with it. It just, well, there's no consequence to it. But in some future moment, data points come in and they fire these imprints and they color or warp our sense of reality and they, they create subjective experiences. So the classic example that I use in the book and the classical example I, when I give lectures is that fucking plane, that amazing miracle plane that landed on the Hudson River. You remember that yeah, a few years back, right? If you watch the- U- I was out here when that happened. Actually. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever watched the YouTube video of it? I don't know if I have. Go and watch. Okay, something very interesting happens if you take a close look at the people that come out on the, uh, they come out on the wing. Some are going like this, and some are like bent, hell bent over themselves. Really? Okay. And what this is is that's karma. Karma isn't the plane crashing. The karma is that for each individual in the very same plane, they all experienced it differently. Can you agree to that? Yeah. Some people thought it was a liberation and and an unbelievable miracle that they survived. Other of them are thinking like, I've got to sue the airline because how the hell did this happen to me? (laughs) Right, right. So how do you account for that? Well, you account for that because the karma is not the plane crash. Everybody was in the same plane that crashed. But 300 passengers or 180 passengers or 100 passengers experienced that predicament, that circumstance differently. So then you say karma is accounting for how they perceive the data points of reality and what kind of subjective experience they had. If they had moments of generosity in the past, if they had moments of kindness, if they had moments of gratitude in the past, then the very same circumstance that they're reading in the the immediate environment creates fires, an imprint, an old memory of something where they feel abundance of joy. So it's totally possible because reality is empty that a adverse circumstance like a plane crash could be perceived as something magnificent and as a miracle to be celebrated a tsunami that comes in and wipes out in 2005 with the whole shoreline of sri lanka you do have cases of people that feel blessed and fortunate and willing to give and create orphanages and bring children in and they lost their children but they found others and they have tears of gratitude because of that tsunami how do you explain that you explain that because the tsunami isn't the the karma the karma is the way that people live you and i the way that we live creates imprints in our minds that when the tsunami hits us we see the tsunami because the tsunami is empty we can see it differently you can go that's the most awful thing it devastated me for the rest of my life i'll never be the same and it's all about me and you're totally paranoid about the next one or the tsunami can hit and it can make you unbelievably generous you could have a complete revolution of your life's purpose you can drop your job on the spot and rehabilitate the entire shoreline of sri lanka and develop orphanages and food shelter services and and it could transform your life because it's empty and because the imprint of karma matters Everything that we say, think, and do in this moment is setting up a future moment of our own life to, to filter reality in such a way that it will create our own subjective experience. You are completely responsible for your life. Not just now, you are the product, the recipient, the bellhop of your past actions. And today, what you do in terms of your circumstance, how you relate to your circumstance, is setting you up in a future life. That's the basic principle of karma. Now, if you do good things, you will feel good things. That is called merit. Okay. And if you do harmful things, you feel like shit. And that's called karma. And if you bank your good deeds and you say, I want a trip to Greece and I want to feel when I get to Greece, because isn't it true? You could book a flight, get to Greece. The conditions are perfect. You could sit down in your little bikini and order a cocktail and you can feel totally depressed. That's true and that's possible. But you could also sit down in a rainy environment on the plains of South Dakota and go, this is, I feel so free here and I see, I feel so happy here. That's also possible. And so if you wanted then to use your merit for the most maximal effective thing, you dedicate it. It's called dedication. And what you say is, by these good acts, may I achieve 
enlightenment. May I and others achieve enlightenment. It's like putting a little bit of your positive energy, earmarking it so that you can have not just a good experience, but a realization. And that's what's considered the most meritorious or the most effective use of your merit. And this is why it's crazy in our meditative environment and secular society. We have no idea about karma or merit. None. But from a Buddhist point of view, that's how you have realizations on your gradual stages of your path. Your realizations, your epiphanies, your gradual epiphanies are not random occurrences. They are a byproduct of your merit. Think about that. So sitting to meditate, breathing with no merit, that's why you've been doing it for 20 years and it hasn't changed your life. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Another thing came to mind uh, on that, how we frame pain, suffering, you know, offense, like you so eloquently described. Uh, a I've, phrase got, that, I've got to go in five minutes. Okay, we're good. We're good. Uh, editors, we can leave that in even. That's great. Because... <laughs> Because I know exactly where I'm, I'm going. I'm living in temporal life right now. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm glad. No, it's perfect because I have another interview and I'm, I know I'm going to sew a perfect bow on this, I think. But I find that through that lens in my own subjective experience, not only am I able to get the merit out of past experiences that have been challenging or painful, but I'm finding increasingly that even in the eye of the storm that I might happen to be in, that even though I feel intensely uncomfortable, and might even suffer to a degree in those situations that I know that there's merit and there's value in those situations as I go. Mm. That makes it a lot easier to take myself and my little fucking problems a lot less serious, even when I'm in the middle of it and I, my skin is burning off at times. That is so powerful mm. to be able to live like that, life like that where it's like, this moment, even as I'm in it, has purpose. Yes. You know, and there's value in the whole rich experience of life, not just singing Kumbaya, all meditating together on in Bali or whatever, you know, although that might be fun too. Mm -hmm. So I, God, I really appreciate that. So much perspective. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you uh, in closing is, what does your personal prayer and meditation life look like? If I had a hidden camera in your, you know, at your altar bedroom, wherever you do your thing. I have right now a lot of anger and a lot of fear in my life because I'm going through a midlife crisis. So if you were to catch me at this stage in my life, 42 years old, uh, <clears throat> I have lots of fear and a lot, a lot of anger. <clears throat> and so I am, you know, my prayers are to find a way to use my practice in order to understand what is driving me. Why, how can I benefit myself and others in not to get rid of this? I'm not looking for a way out of this. I'm looking exactly as you said, to find a way to use this for my benefit. And it's not totally clear right now, and it's very, very painful. It's very painful. I've been going through something for almost a year and a half during the course of writing this book. It's been extremely painful, probably the one of the hardest periods of my life since I was burning myself as a kid. And yet, <clears throat> it is opening me in some way to new possibilities and new ways of looking at the world, which I would not be privy to had I not gone through this. And so I'm not running anymore. I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm embracing it. I am getting waylaid by it. But my prayers are, may this too be used for some higher purpose for myself and others. And that's the constant refrain or mantra, like this pain, th this confusion, this anger, may this too lead to some development for myself and for others, some modicum of evolution for myself and others. On the cusp of graduating out of this bubble of difficulty, may I also grow so that I can evolve and others can evolve with me as a result of it. And just like you survived a cataclysm in your addiction life that has been parlayed to your advantage and through your own advantage you have served others, this too is going to be pivotal for me. It's excruciatingly painful right now, but maybe a year, five years, or ten years out, I'll look back on this very time with this interview and I'll go, I was going through the shit, and, but look, look what happened. Look what happened. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And you will. Thank you. And so let it be done. You've taught us so much today, Miles. Who have, You've mentioned a few of your teachers, but 
who are three teachers or teachings uh, that have influenced you and your work that you might point the audience toward if they want to go pick up another book or do a retreat or anything of that nature? I would go uh, instantly to Bob Thurman, Robert Thurman, Professor Robert Thurman of Columbia University, particularly his Jewel Tree of Tibet book. I would go to my mentor, Joe Luizzo, and his Sustainable Happiness book. And I would go to Geshe Tenzin Zopa, who wrote the foreword to my book. And he has a lot of e-books and free books online, Geshe Tenzin Zopa. Geshe is a title. It means uh, doctorate. Uh, so his name is Tenzin Zopa. Thank and you I, for our <clears throat> producer. who will be trying to Google that for the show notes. I appreciate the clarification. Sometimes the email might, what was that thing they said? I'm like, I don't, you know, you Google just as well as I do. So thank you for clarifying. Most, most definitely. Thank you for the opportunity to share. I just want to make mention that the book is dedicated to the nuns of Copan Nunnery. You can Google Copan Nunnery or you can visit my website to the, and go to the campaign page. And the nuns inspire me because they are on a 25-year odyssey of their gradual path training. And when I was writing the book and experiencing this great hardship, I would often, in the darkness and the early mornings of my writing, think of them. Many of them have been orphaned. Many of them have been experienced torture or rape or something equivalent to that, major life catastrophes. They have made their way over the Himalayan pass into Nepal, and they show such grace and such humility, and such kindness, and such exquisite joy that they are for uh, for someone like me who is stingy, and angry, and resentful, and bitter, and selfish. They are the epitome of the path. They are the full flowering of what this path is capable of. To be able to embrace hardship with such dignity and such grace at a time on the planet where so many women are now discovering how powerful they are and at a time where the power roles on the planet need to shift towards the power of the feminine, I have dedicated this book to the nuns of Copan because of their inspiring practice, their endurance, their perseverance, their generosity of spirit, their grace, their compassion, and also to celebrate the historic opportunity that women in Buddhism face, that the nuns are taking their their equal place amongst men as powerful teachers and leaders for the future. I believe that they can all show us, each and every one of us, what it means to live with dignity and grace. And I would very much welcome everybody to check out the nuns, how inspiring they are, and to recognize that this book, uh, my portion of all the proceeds go to them. And I'm also trying to connect with a network of people that can help me serve the nuns of Copan. They live on 50 cents a day, and, and they are preserving an ancient lineage and tradition that could not only illuminate and has benefited my life, but has benefited so many countless lives. So I'm looking for assistance and help to help support the nuns. If you're out there and some part of this conversation has inspired you and motivated you, please find a way to contact me so together we can actually give something back. We are so blessed with fortune and opportunity, and yet we are uh, we're hanging by dental floss in our circumstance and our survival, and these nuns show us a way that we can live together in much greater harmony, and it's our duty, I believe, to try to find a way to support them. Thank you so much. And where can people find your website and contact So that would be miles, milesneal.com, M-I-L-E-S-N-E-A-L-E.com. Cool. And uh, by the way, I'd recommend that people follow you on Instagram too. We didn't we didn't have time to get into it, but I wanted to talk about your journey with these 32 students it's to Nepal. It's all on Instagram. It's been yeah, it's, documented. It's amazing. It's it's next level. So, Thank you so much. Yeah, I would I would highly advise people follow you on Instagram and check that out. So yeah, I really really appreciate this. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Me thank too. you for your good energy and thank you for all that you're doing. Awesome. Really man. appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks for coming by.